Second question, put your seatbelt on. Look at your neighbor and tell him, put your seatbelt on. Why should you wait until marriage to have sex? Yeah, I said it. Sex. I said it. I'm comfortable. You're not. And if anybody should be awkward, it should be me, but I'm fine. Like, why? Don't be, please stop being weirded out by this. And the church should talk about this, and you should talk about it too, with your children, with your family. Like, it's not weird. Like, just be all right. You're all right. You talk about it to your girlfriend or your boyfriend, whatever. We're going to talk about it in church. You know what? Can I be honest with you? The church has um, forbidden a lot of things, but we've never told you why you should abstain. The church for years has been like, don't do this, don't do that. You better not look at that. Don't do this, don't do that. And then we say, amen, hallelujah, I'll see you at Golden Corral. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, for, for, for decades, church is like, don't do this, you sinner. Don't do it, don't do it. And we know what not to do. We just don't know why we shouldn't be doing it. But I'm going to tell you something else. You know what the Bible says? The law provokes us to sin. So all the preachers telling you, don't, 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 guess what? You're doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it. Don't admit it right now, but you know you did. All right? And uh, because the, this is scripture. The law actually provokes us to sin. If you have a child and you say, don't unplug that cord right there. Don't unplug it. You walk away, what are they going to do? Coming right for the cord. Coming right, going, unplug it. Anybody got kids in the house? 930 left, way harder because they, they had children. They know. Why? Because when you tell somebody don't do it, the law actually entices them to sin. That's, that's your Bible. That's in your Bible, by the way. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm going to tell you why it's wrong. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute and becomes one body with her, for the scriptures say the two are united into one, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one in spirit with him. Run from sexual sin, for no other sin clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? who lives in you and was given to you by God, you do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. That's amazing. We just had church in here. It's amazing. I love this right here. Do you not know that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you? And then he says, do you not know that your life is no longer your own? You were purchased with a high price. See, this is where American Christianity has failed you. Because you still think your life is yours. You think that Jesus died to forgive you so you could keep on doing what you're doing. You think Jesus died for you to empower you to keep doing you. But the gospel is that my old man died in the watery graves of baptism. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Everybody wants a Savior. Nobody wants a Lord. Everybody wants to be forgiven. Nobody wants to obey. The, the metric that we can determine if you really love God is do you obey him? Because his word commands us to do things, to abstain from things that we don't want to do. Can I tell you something else? In evangelical Christianity, we've lowered the bar of salvation. Here's what I mean by that. We've said, all right, every head bowed, every eye closed. And if you need to be forgiven, you just slip your hand up right now, he'll forgive you, and then just put it right back down so nobody sees. I don't mean to be making fun, but I, I, I want you to feel this. I want you to feel this. Do you understand that is not how Jesus Christ ministered? Jesus would be preaching to thousands of people that wanted to follow him. You know what he would say? 
are you sure you really want to follow me? Read the Gospels. Jesus would start with thousands, and by the time he was done with his sermon, there'd be about 12 left. (laughs) Today, preachers run to crowds. 2,000 years ago, Jesus ran them off. Not that he didn't love the world. He loved the world, but he wanted to make sure the world loved him back. Jesus said, Oh, you really, you, oh, so you want saved. You want salvation. Okay, great, awesome. So you want to be my disciple. Then pick up your cross and follow me. Are we reading the Bible today? I'm going to do you one better. He also said, okay, you want to follow me? You should count the cost. Because a builder wouldn't start a construction project and then run out of money halfway through. Everybody laugh at him. Now we pull that verse out when it's time to build the church, you know, building campaign. But let's bring it into context. He's not talking about your building. He doesn't care about the brick and mortar. He's talking about your soul. Jesus is literally saying, are you sure you really want to follow me? Have you read what I'm going to command of you? Because see, you're going to have to die so I can live. Are you sure you want to follow me? You sure you want to repent? You sure you want to trust in me? Because if so, it's going to cost you something. But here's the key. When you surrender and lay down your life, it's only then that you find it. Jesus said, any man who clings to his life will surely lose it. But anyone who gives up his life for my sake shall surely find it. Jesus did not come into this world to condemn you. He came into this world to give you life and life abundantly. Life in its fullness is found in obedience to his word in scripture. I'm talking about sex outside of marriage. But I just needed to, just needed to go there. You know Why? The Bible forbids, and I'm just going to put this out here. The Bible, listen, sex is not evil. It's not dirty. It's not wicked. It's not unclean. It's a gift from God between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. Now, you call that hate speech, and you can go ahead and get mad at me. But I'm just a messenger. I didn't write the Bible. I just declare it. And do you know what happens when you disagree with the Bible? You're wrong. It's true. Why, why does the Bible forbid sex outside of marriage? Well, what I just read to you in 1 Corinthians 6 tells you why. Because sex is not just a physical act, it's a spiritual act. It says the two become one. You, do you not know that the spirit of Christ lives inside of you? You're joining it to someone else? You, the two, it's a spiritual connection. You're talking in the back. E.V. Walker dropped a truth bomb on me, and, I'm, and I put it in my sermon, but I told him I'd give him a shout-out. Here it is. And it's true. In the Old Testament, if a man and a woman just had sex, and it was not out of love, they were just, it was physical, the Bible would say they laid together. But when they were married, and it's a husband and wife, the Bible said, used different terminology, it says they knew one another. Ooh. Like Adam and Eve, when he saw her for the first time, he was like, whoa, man. That's how she got the name woman. And then the Bible says, and then, they, then he knew her. <laughs> you, you catch it later. It's okay. Um, but sexual intimacy, you know someone, your spirit, you are, the two become one. You know them. They know you. There's a, there is a spiritual dimension to that relationship. That's why the Bible forbids it with anybody else. That's why, listen, you create bonds with this person. You really do. Scripture teaches it. That's why when you sleep with somebody that you're not married to and then you break up, and that's why your breakups are a dumpster fire and they're ugly and violent and everybody's crying and screaming and you're all confused. It's because you did a permanent thing with a temporary person. I'm going to help you real quick because some of you think you're in love, but you're really in lust. And there's a difference. Now, love and lust feel a lot alike at first, but they're completely different. Lust is always in a hurry. Love is patient. Ladies, I'm talking to you. Love is patient. If he can't wait for you, always in a hurry, he don't love you. I got a brother in the back who's with me. 
by the way, another truth bomb from this is that, uh, and Walker, I got to give you glory for this one too, bro. I know you, this is, he said, men will lie to women and women will lie to themselves. He loves me. He loves me. No, he don't. He don't love you. Stop it. If he loved you, he'd be patient. Some of you are like, I'm never coming back to this church. <laughs> Welcome to Vision Church. And, you know, at least you were here. You know what I mean? At least you were here. You heard the truth while you were here. Lust is never satisfied. Always wants more. But love is content. Lust is always looking for the next best thing. Checking the DMs, refreshing. Who is that? I'm looking around. Wandering eyes. It's lust. It's not love. Love is content and satisfied with what it has. Lust is selfish. Love is selfless. Lust cares about the appearance and love cares about the heart. Are you in love or are you in lust? One more thing on this, I'm gonna move on. Proverbs chapter six, verse 27. Can a man scoop a flame into his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? Can he walk on hot coals and not blister his feet? So it is with the man who sleeps with another man's wife. He who embraces her will not go unpunished. Proverbs six is not just talking about adultery. It's also in the context of sex outside of marriage. If you, Proverbs says it this way, if you play with fire, you will get burned. I just feel like the mothers in the house today are being like, thank God, this preacher. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to you. I'm telling, talking to you, children. And I'm just, the moms were amen and hard at 9 o'clock. They were like, yeah, you hear that? No. <laughs> um, but <laughs> sex is like a... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> TJ, you laughing, bro. You're making me laugh. <laughs> okay. Um, but sex is like a fire, and the fireplace is marriage. Fire can bring health, warmth, comfort, and vitality. But if it's not in the boundaries of the fireplace, that same fire can bring destruction and death and chaos. You don't like the boundaries God put on sex, but he's the one who designed it and knows how it best functions and operates. If you take it out of the fireplace, you're gonna get burned and you're going to destroy some stuff in the process. Satan has been lying to you from the beginning. He's been trying to tell you that just you don't need to hear, you don't need God's boundaries. You don't need God's word to be satisfied and fulfilled and happy. Just break God's commandment and then you'll live your best life. He's a liar. The devil is a liar. And some people say, well, you know, Jesus didn't really mention sexuality and Jesus didn't mention homosexuality. He didn't mention sleeping with somebody else. That what, you, Oh, you want to go there with me about Jesus? Jesus didn't lower the bar of sexuality. He raised it. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, he raised it. I'm going to help you real, real quick. Jesus said, if you've even looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you committed adultery with her. Congratulations. Jesus is showing you that sin is not just the behavior of the body, but it's the condition of your mind. Before sin is ever manifest in the body, it's first conceived in the mind. Jesus is purifying our lives. He wants to call us to a new place of holiness. He wants men, he wants our eyes to be holy, to be sanctified, to be pure. He wants a new level of holiness out of our lives. He raised the bar. He did not lower it. Really fast too, people, somebody that asked this question also said, well, how do I abstain from it? How do I abstain from it? And I thought that was such a good, genuine question. I just want to touch on it really, really fast. Number one, you got to prioritize your relationship with the father above him or her. And if you really love him or her, why would you want to lead them away from their father? Number two, date a Christian. A real one. The people on YouTube hate me for this one, too. They really do. They're like, he's so old. He's so old school. You're welcome. <laughs> I've said it a million times. God in his word told Samson and Solomon, don't be dating these women that don't believe. Samson was the strongest. 
Solomon was the wisest. Both of them ignored God's counsel and believed that they needed fulfillment outside of God's boundary. And the strongest and the wisest both fell in disgrace and brought destruction on themselves and their family. If the strongest and the wisest fell, how do you think you're going to stand? Make up your mind before you're tempted. Here's another, this is another point. Make up your mind before temptation. So go to a coffee shop that's fully lit with people around and talk about your boundaries there. Yeah. Not on the couch watching the Netflix. because <laughs> And here's another one. You're going to hate me for this one, but I don't really care. You don't have to date someone for seven and a half years before you get married to them. Like, y'all, like, you've been dating. Like, how do I abstain from sex before marriage? It's so hard. Well, you've been dating her for eight years. It's probably pretty hard. It's probably difficult. It, you know, you should just put a ring on it. Listen, that's not the only motivation for getting married. Don't tweet me on that. But I am telling you, you, you know, you, you're trying to live by the world standards. I've got to date for two and a half, three years. Got to make sure everything's right and we're totally compatible. Let me help you out. You're not totally compatible. And love is not a feeling. It's a choice. It's a decision. And if she loves Jesus and you love Jesus, you're compatible. Congratulations. You're welcome. It's a decision. Love is a decision. It's not a feeling. And y'all... You'd be like, well, I've been trying to find these dating verses in the Bible. You're not going to find them. <laughs> because they didn't know what dating was. They were like you. <laughs> and I'm like, Somebody's going to hate on me for this for sure. I don't care. <laughs> I'm not, I'm being funny. Please hear me. <laughs> oh, God. I'm sorry. I'm going to hear about this later. Um. But in all seriousness, in all seriousness, though, um, there, there wasn't a process of dating. In the Old Testament, if you slept with somebody that wasn't your wife, congratulations, you just consummated the marriage. That's your, that's your spouse now. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm being a little facetious. But in all seriousness, you should take time. You should get to know someone. You should do your due diligence. You should bring them around your family. You should bring them around your friends. You should not rush it, okay? But at the same time, you don't have to date for 10 years before you put a ring on it, okay? Just trying to help you. All right, and, and I'm gonna, I gotta put this, the clock is really getting up there, so I gotta hurry up. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Healing is available in the person of Jesus Christ. If you have been, if you've been infidelity, if you've experienced infidelity, if you've messed up with your sexual life, if you've got a past and you've got baggage, I want you to know there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Come to Jesus, repent, trust him, give him your life, and he makes all things new. That's the beauty of Jesus Christ.